We're back on air. Sorry to everyone for the for the slight delay. Just a, a minor um, lineup uh, change in our lineup. We're uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sir Abdubi, who's actually going to um, be talking to us again later later in TFT 13. But uh, he's very kindly stepped in to uh, to solve a solve a wee issue we've had. So. Saurabh is going to be presenting to us on the practical side of configuration management. So welcome and thank you very much for stepping into the breach. Thank you very much for, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> giving me the time to set up things again very quickly. Um, Chrissy, so uh, this presentation I had uh, done previously at another event and um, I thought it would be a good uh, addition at this point. Just wanted to make sure. Is the can you can you see the the agenda page up? Yes, I can. Yes. Awesome. So um, so this discussion is is mostly about the the practical side of configuration management. And when we say the practical side, we're really talking about you know the, the side that most people are not very well uh, comfortable with. Um, again, the the original um, audience for this discussion was people who have who, have, who are more practitioners, but who haven't yet put it in real life. So what I had done back, back then, and what I'm going to do again today, is take this outside the basic scope of what we think of, you know, in terms of configuration management and CMDB. So um, as the agenda, uh, I had a little bit of before we start, which is just a background of what is this session about and what is, what is it not about, by the way. Uh, There's going to be a discussion about configuration management effort. It's going to be a, a little bit of discussion about the practical side of CMDB, as in what does it take for you to build one, um, and what's the exercise that you typically need to go through, um, and an interactive design session towards the end in which, you know, we can, this is where, uh, Christy, I'm going to need a little bit of your help in uh, kind of going in a little bit of discussion, uh, and we're going to uh, define a service, which is not a typical IT service. You're going to go outside the box and define a non-IT service in um, in a CMDB. Okay. So so that's the plan. Um, I'm going to start with this. Uh, so this diagram, everybody who's attending this, I'm pretty sure, is, is pretty well aware of this diagram. It's uh, from the original um, ITIL books. Uh, it is a typical configuration management activity model. Now, a week or maybe 10 days before you know this presentation was done, um, I was in London and I was talking to Stuart Rands, who's you know one of the authors of um, the the service transition volume, and our discussion was around this particular at, at one point around this particular diagram, and he said that in his honest opinion, not many people actually understood what this diagram was trying to convey. This diagram is not about this is my process. This diagram is about everything you need to do during configuration management. So one of the things that people typically tend to do is, you know, they typically tend to look at this diagram and say, okay, we've got to do management and planning, we've got to do identification, we're going to do control, we're going to do status account reporting, we're going to follow all of these things, and then we're going to have these documents and this ready and that ready, and it turns into a really, really complicated thing. So the approach that um, we recommend, uh, that we initially thought of, and we've gone ahead with uh, suggesting this at a few places, is this. Simplify this. There are inputs, like every process, there's certain process execution, and there are outputs. And in terms of execution, there's very simply three main steps. There's the step of metadata management, conf data management, and organ verification. Oversimplifying it, but sometimes that helps. There, the thought behind that diagram is that every configuration management effort is essentially, and, and I use the word effort, you know, I can't show you, but I'm making those air quotes right now. Um, every configuration management effort is a project followed by a process, right? Because I personally haven't come across one organization that starts their business by saying, I'm going to make a CMDB, right? Nobody, nobody absolutely ever does that. Everybody starts off by saying, um, I'm going to make this business happen, it's going to be successful, and oh, by the way, now I need to start managing things. Now I need to start thinking about you know, what service I'm offering, 
I've always been offering services, but I, now I need to start thinking about those things. And now I need to come back to the level of saying, I need to design my CMDB. So it's always a project, which is the initial design of CMDB, followed by the process. And in terms of project, the activities are very simple. There's, again, metadata creation, which is design of your configuration model, the data creation, which is populating the CMDB, and data verification or validation, which is making sure that everything that went into the CMDB was accurate. The process is that of configuration management itself. Same three activities that we had, oversimplified as they may be, the same three activities we had earlier. There's metadata management, which is managing the config model. You know, new changes that have been brought, somebody comes up with a new solution design, that has to be added. Um, you know, application development says, you know, we're gonna come up with, we're gonna start using virtualized environment. That needs to be added to the system. Then there's data management, which, you know, which is what we understand most easily in terms of you know, managing CMDB using change. And then there's verification and audit. Again, making sure that the CMDB is validated every few days, every few weeks, every few months, whatever your frequency preference might be. So going back to the concept, it's a, pro it's, it's a project followed by a process approach. In terms of CMDB definition, now we're getting into the part where we're talking about what does it take to build a CMDB? This is the practical side discussion. And uh, I might be going a little fast here, but uh, when we get to that exercise that you know I've promised a little later, we're going to have uh, a lot of time spent here and there discussing things. So CMDB definition means define the conceptual data model, which is the configuration model, which I was talking about earlier. The service definition, which is the defining each service into its components and subcomponents, and exceptions to the model. Now, I used to typically think exceptions to the model are very rare and don't happen as much. Sorry. Uh, and they don't happen as much. But then I realized, and um, I think it, it will, uh, I, was, I was reading some documentation prepared by um, Rob uh, England, and the discussion about the standard plus case approach kind of filters in at some place to say, there is the standard, which is the service definition, and there will always be cases, which are the exceptions to the model. So the CMDB definition can definitely use that concept. The conceptual configuration model, therefore, has three, three parts to it. There are the CI types, you know, classes, um, different tools call them different things, but you know, it's basically servers, applications, services. Um, I tend to put the remaining three things in there, you know, fruits, vegetables, dairy, because you never know which service we're talking about. Attributes, um, again, I typically tend to put them in two sections. There are value-added attributes, those that are needed because they add value to processes. Uh, you know, things like CI owner or CI uh, you know, approver or things like that, or support group. And then there are non-attributes, those things that are needed because they help in reporting about uh, the configuration model. You know, things like, uh, not to, off the top of my head, things like um, how many, you know, how many rack space, uh, spaces is it using, or the server is using, or how long has this been in production? Well, maybe not that much, but... Uh, things like that. Uh, things that you typically say, I need this information because I'm going to report on it. So there's non-attributes and attributes. And then finally, there are CI relationships. Now, personally, I love the to talk about CI relationships, and maybe I will spend an additional couple of minutes on that, the speed at which I'm going. <laughs> so CI relationships are, you know, they're relationships between CIs. But what does a relationship really mean? You know, uh, a relationship, in my view, is a word. And it, it's that word which defines what's happening between these two things. I can say, you know, a server is an apple for, and that's, that's what I'm calling the relationship, is an apple for uh, an operating system. And if I define that by saying is an apple for, I'm trying to mean that is running or hosts an operating system, then that's what the relationship means. Most people get really confused about, you know, we're talking about relationships like depends and, uh, you know, it depends on this, or this connects to that, or, you know, it hosts that. At the end of the day, relationships are just plain words. You can use these relationships to actually come up with a lot of interesting things. Think about design concepts, things, things like redundancy, failover, automation, environment, server farms, all of these things in a typical CMDB, when you look at it, 
this this is valuable information to have to start with, right? If you're trying to fix, uh, if you're trying to fix an incident, you're trying to fix a uh, a problem, something major in the environment. You need information about how the environment looks. Your staff needs the information about your engineers need this information about how the how this environment looks. And to give them that information, you need your CMDB to be able to convey this information. Relationships are the ones that actually help you understand these design concepts. Now I've seen examples of this is a cluster with the n plus one format, right? So I can very easily make relationships, and I can name relationships in as simple format. I can say, you know, the relationships change status. You know, the, a relation, there's a relationship between six servers and a service that says these six servers impact the service. But the moment there are five servers remaining and one server goes down, now I can say the service depends on these five servers. Just wordplay at the end of the day. And it sounds very simple. It sounds almost oversimplifying certain concepts. But, but that's, what, that's what we really need to do in order to understand what, the CMDB, what, what, what is the value that the CMDB is providing to us. We need to look at it from these simple concepts because the people who are going to be using this information need to know this before we get into the concept of, you know, before we start troubleshooting a problem. If I don't know that this is, that there's a redundant system and there's no impact on service, if one goes down, the second one will take over. Uh, if I don't know that from, you know, some knowledge database or some kind of uh, criminal knowledge, then I don't know that information unless I figure it out. And the benefit, again, of having effective relationships in CMDB is to help in defining these design concepts. Now, here's an interesting activity. Uh, and Kirsty, since you know, I had a bigger audience last time, I just have you this time uh, to talk back to. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. Which one of these is not a CI, according to you? Let me make sure I have that. I'm sorry, I can't hear you clearly, or at all, actually. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm back again. <laughs> sorry about that. So, so let me bring bring that. Um, let me bring that slide back up. So my question was, and let me share it also. It's not shared again, I think. Okay. So my question was, which one of these is not a configuration item? Okay, since you're taking that much time, I'm going to put another question out. Which yeah, one of yeah. these is a configuration item? Oh, you've got bottles of milk, I've got two apples, I've got a football and some bread. There's a configuration item, uh, the football? The question that you should be asking me at this time is, what is the service? Right. Because without knowing the service, you have no idea what configuration yeah. item can it be. Yes. Right? I mean, if, if, we were playing, if we were playing football, then yes, definitely, the football is the CI. Mm -hmm. If we were in a restaurant or in a deli, the bread yes. might be the CI, mm -hmm. right? In a cafe, the milk might be the CI. And there is a little bit of uh, discussion around, you know, perishable items can be CIs or not. And Stuart and I had some fun discussions about that in the past. But the essential question is, without knowing what the service is, we have no idea what configuration item might be. Mm -hmm. And we've actually heard this from our clients. Most of our clients actually say, we, ha we haven't defined services. Or, you know, these are real quotes, actually, from, from uh, clients of mine. We don't support services, we have applications. Or our top level is more conceptual. This is a part of the discussion that I'm going to have, you know, in my scheduled session, I guess, 24 hours or 21 hours from now. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, whether we call it or not, we are providing a service. Whether you want to, whether you want to say that you're providing a service or you don't want to say that you're providing a service, you're still providing a service. And if you're, 
if there is an expectation that something is going to get delivered, if you have, if you're providing something, you know, applications, uh, servers, whatever you're providing, you're still providing a service. So here's another interesting game. Kirsty, you're here, right? Yes, yes, I'm here listening. <laughs> awesome. So here's a game called Name That Service, right? Let's talk about this. A woman's found dead in a closed room with a broken window. What is the service being provided by the CSU, the crime scene unit team? What uh, do you think? Forensics. Exactly. Forensic service. Here's another example. What is the service provided by a theme park? Uh, entertainment. Exactly. So, so this is simple. I mean, whether, whether you call it so or not, these are services that, that people are providing. I mean, if you, if you really want to take it to an extreme, I can almost say me taking care of my daughter is me providing a service to her. Yes. Or a doctor taking care of a patient is a doctor providing a service to a patient. So the next part of this discussion is, you know, going back to the configuration model, the, the CMDB part of the discussion. So how do you make a configuration model in three steps? I listed out the three steps earlier. Now we're going to put it on in a view. You identify your CI classes. You identify the relationships between these CI classes. And then you identify the attributes for those individual CI classes. And that's essentially you know, that's that's exactly what you want to do. It's it's not really complicated. One of, I guess, I can think of a couple of ways in which I've done this in real environments or real client situations. Um, you can start by looking at a few services and trying to understand what works best. And or you can start the other way around. You can start by defining a model initially and saying, "Hey, this is my model, and I would like you to build everything." around this model. So here's another interesting concept that we've heard you know, many times. Dev, you know, application development created something, they threw it over the wall, and now we've got to support it. Because last Thursday I was at a client location, they said pretty much every application that runs in their environment has been created like that. Application support created it, and then they said, oh sorry, application development created it, and then they said, hey guys, here you go, you're going to support it now. Hmm. There is a there's an agreement or there's there's almost a mutual understanding that needs to exist between both sides you know the development and the operations one that says hey guys if you're expecting us to support it if you're expecting us to support it uh, i'm sorry i think i missed the slide I missed the slide if you're expecting us to support it you better conform to the uh, to the situation that we're creating for you or to, to the requirements that we're setting forth for you. Uh, I think a lot of organizations call this operational readiness uh, evaluation or something like that. But many organizations don't go in that direction. Coming back to the slide I was at. I'm sorry, is the screen still shared just to make sure? Yes, it, yes it is. Awesome. Um, right, so back to making a configuration model in three steps. The three steps being Create CI, create CI classes, or identify CI classes, identify relationships, and identify the attributes. Now, what I would like to do, so this is where we're going outside the box. I'm going to go and share a different screen. This is a blank page, essentially. And, Christy, this is, what is it on? So this is, it starts screen share. Now, do you have the view to a blank page right now? Yes, sir. Awesome. So this is where we're going to do this this fun little exercise, and believe me, it goes at, at the place where I did it last time. It kind of went into a direction I never expected, and I wouldn't mind going back in that direction. So we were talking about forensic service, right? If we were to dis if we were to do this exercise of service definition, defining a service using a configuration model, or based on you know what what matters, what you care about. And we we said we're going to do this for forensics service. What are we, how are we going to do this, right? So I'm going to try and um, emulate the diagram that was there before, which was you know the diagram of uh, the diagram of 
the, the configuration model. We we'll start with a simple box that says Predix service. Right? And I'm going to combine a lot of concepts that some of the other people here are going to be speaking about in this, in this, thought, in this discussion. Um, I've been mean, following a lot of this, this, you know, a lot of others who've, who've come up with some really great stuff. So I'm going to use the, you know, the discussion about how does an end user see these services. So let's, let's first start by identifying, so for a forensic service, who's the provider? Uh, that would be CSU, I guess. Okay, CSU is the provider. And we've got uh, the customer who is, well, I can say the customer is citizens in general. Yeah. Right, because they don't want more homicides to happen. I'm, I'm just simulating the situation that happened in that example, in the name the service example, right? And who is the end user for this case? I guess the next of kin to the woman who died, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now from this view, the purpose of forensic service, let's say, is to identify the killer. I'm going to combine a little bit of crime investigation and forensic service in this case. The purpose is to identify the killer. To identify that, now we're talking about what does this service depend on? Right? There are there may be other services that depends on. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the sequence of how things take, take place. Um, to provide that service, a crime scene unit gets there, so they have to depend on some level of transportation service. Right? Yep. Uh, at the same time, it, they have to depend upon, I'm, I'm trying to think as we go around at this point. The last time the discussion went crazy a little too quickly, so I want to make sure that we get there, but a little, you know, with, with some time at our hands. Yeah. So transportation service is one. Um, yes, the technology services, things like, uh, I don't know, the, the mass spectrometer, the yeah. DNA analysis uh, machine, it, and all of those yeah, things, right? So, services. Sorry? The laboratory services, I guess they are. Right. So, I wonder if I should break them down, or should I just... Well, let's just do this. We took one service. Let's break this down. Let's say, let's call this DNA analysis. We're going to the level of application. We're just jumping one level down at this point. We're talking service as a CI type. This is, let's say, a third-party service. Let's say this was outsourced, right? Getting the dead body back to the crime lab, that's our job. So third-party service. And DN analysis is an application. And similarly, you have um, another application called the mass spec, the mass spectrometer, mm -hmm. which does other things. I actually don't know what it does. I just heard that one way too often in crime investigation shows, you know, ESI, NCIS, all of those things. Yep. So I'm just playing around with that. This is a third-party service. Typically, when something as a service, it's best to leave that in its own, you know, in its own silo, in its own box. So let's change the color of this thing for a second and let's say that this is outside our scope of you know management now another interesting question that I've been asked way too many times and I think it's it's valuable to say so is what exactly is the service or, or what exactly do you put in here and what do you not as in when you're thinking about is this going to be a CI should I should I count it as a CI class or should I not count it as a CI class? The way it has helped me most often is to avoid thinking about you know whether this is a server, whether this provides something or not. But to, to be more simplified, again, 
I'm all about oversimplifying this and say, what do I care about managing it? Remember, mm -hmm. the difference, the, the only difference between a service asset and a configuration item was defined as the fact that a configuration item is a service asset that you care to manage to provide the service. So our question is, for this thing to be a CI, pretty much everything is a service asset, right? So for this thing to be a CI, do I care about it to manage it? So going in that direction, I'm going to say DNA analysis and mass spec are the two applications that I support. Now, how do they run? For DNA analysis, I have an appliance, right? I've hit the infrastructure layer. For mass spectrometer, I have an appliance. Again, I'm hitting infrastructure. At the same time, the clients and the service both depend on two things. A service or a web server, which is your front end of that appliance. And again, I have no idea how these things actually work, so I'm just, I'm just going ahead and creating them. A database server, something that actually holds DNA rec records of you know people all over the world, or well, people whose DNA rec records you're supposed to. Same way with the mass spectrometer, there is a web server. I'm just going to put an IIS there. I don't even know if, if it uses IIS, but I'm going to put an IIS. An appliance that talks to a database of all possible um, samples of things that you can analyze using mass spectrometer. Now, by doing this exercise, I'm not going to go much in detail with this at, at a high level. So actually, I've attempted to make one small addition of this because this was an interesting part of the, this was the most interesting part of the discussion I thought for the last time presentation. The other thing that is an obvious CI uh, is another internal service that is provided, which is the medical examiner, right? Yeah. You know, somebody has to go look at the body, do the postmortem, and all of that stuff. So they do, they do a certain series of activities, and what do they depend on? They depend on facilities, which is their lab, and they depend on, believe it or not, I'm going to write this down here, the dead body. Yes, I've said it a second time in one year. The dead body is a CI. And that's that's the entire principle of, you know, building up this service from, well, outside in for that. Because when you build this service, when you try to define this service, how is it that it, sh it can help you understand the relationships that are required to support this service? Any questions about what I just did? No, that, it, I, yeah, that's not that's nice and uh, I mean, it's, simple and practical. Exactly. So that's exactly what I was going for, right? Practical side of this. Mm -hmm. So the requirement and, and the thought behind this process, this this entire activity is to make sure that when we're talking about the benefits of a CMDB, you know, at the end of the day, why do we make a CMDB? We want to make sure that we've got all the information. Uh, and we're able to control and manage the CIs. But yes, at the end of the day, it's about being able to support other processes, the other operational processes better. You know, you want to do better change, better incident management, better change management. Yeah. And to be able to do those things, you need to be able to know what your environment really looks like, which is what this is. Let me switch back to the slide very quickly. Oh, this is not good. Sorry, my system is for some reason. <laughs> I mean, a lot of this is, is you know, you you actually you can't manage it if you don't understand it, and mapping it out like this actually helps you understand what what you're actually looking at. Exactly, and that's that's the entire story. That you know, when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about making sure that the service is managed, we want to make sure that we know what the service looks like. Yes. Um, let's go back to. Can you see the slides now, or is it still the, no, the screen that's no, up? I can, no, not. 
I can still just see your diagram. Okay. That's because I have to share it again. Yep, that's it. Just to make sure, Christy, how much time do we have left? About 10 minutes ago? Uh, yeah, we have 10 more minutes. Awesome. Um, so we're, we're pretty much at the end of this discussion, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. The question that I started off with was that the approach that, uh, or the premise that I started off with was that is this going to be practical? And in my view, it's absolutely practical because this is your service centric approach. This is a very simple and maybe even oversimplified approach, and it educates. And I put the word educates because we went, obviously, you know, outside the box in, in, in thinking about forensic service as a service, and we tried to build a CMDB for forensic service. But thinking about the reality of things, you know, when we do this in ITSM, we're trying to do this for IT. So when we're trying to build for companies with 60,000 CIs or 60, you know, 50,000 servers, we're trying to do this at a much, much larger scale. And we've always had that question of, you know, if I start building my CMDB, how am I going to manage it? And if I, if I have my change management process, am I going to be able to you know, support it without actually having a full CMDB with it? So that question is always there. The reason I say it educates, this process educates, is because it typically works best when you do this by interacting with the people who are building this for you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as, as a person who is coming in to build the CMDB, you will never understand how each application, each service looks like unless you actually interact with the service architecture group or the solution architecture group. And the way solution architecture typically looks at these um, services or these, these relationships is in terms of connectivity, in terms of physical relationships. While what we're more concerned of in terms of making it service centric is more service relationships. So yeah. to, for, for solution architecture to be able to understand that what we care about when we provide a service is the fact that service needs to be up and running based on all the parameters that have been defined for that service during service design by, you know, by operations and part of solution architecture based on the way they designed the service itself, you know, the utility component of it and the warranty component of it. It educates them to think about uh, the services that they create from the perspective of service over longer periods of time, and this is where the tomorrow's future part, I guess, kind of plays in. Over longer periods of time, you'll probably see that these, uh, if, if this kind of a, approach is taken, it's going to be it's going to be easier for the development to understand how operations works. Moving on, here's an interesting uh, question that people have asked me quite a number of times, and I thought this is the best slide basically end this on. Mm -hmm. What would work for your organization? You know, everybody says, so wh what should I do with my CMDB? You know, what is the depth of my CMDB? What should it look like? And I know the consultant answer to that question is it depends. Hardly anyone ever tries to put this in a context of saying it depends on what, right? You want to you want to put some some boundaries against that kind of a question. And what what I tried to do was I came up with a pyramid of sorts, which says, based on the goals of your CMDB, you should look at different levels of depth for your CMDB. So if the goal of your CMDB is to reduce infrastructure outage. You need to look at infrastructure CIs. You need to talk about more horizontal setup than more vertical setup. If the goal of your CMDB is to manage IT services, you can think about starting from an application layer. You know, uh, Exchange, SAP, those can be your uh, services. Relate them to infrastructure. If it's a little more, if it's supporting the business groups in achieving the outcomes, you know, in, in doing what they want to do, Start from business outcomes. And it goes, in this case, to Mark Kawasaki and Farah Ramdullah, who came up with this concept um, in TFT 12. I saw their presentation, and that's what gave me the bulb to think about this, you know, the idea to think about this. If you're really talking about business, um, you know, uh, supporting the business groups in achieving their outcomes, then you start from business outcomes. You think about business outcomes and how business services uh, can support those business outcomes. The next level is if you're talking about supporting the business to provide the services. Now the interesting thing is when most people, when most tools do the demo, 
this is the view they're showing to the customers. When you talk about business service management, this is what you're really trying to achieve. Except that you typically, we typically tend to think of it still from an IT perspective. You know, think about this as a business service. If we're talking about a financial organization that sells, uh, you know, let's say that's something that sells online insurance, then we're talking about being the capability that the business provides, the service that the business provides to its end users, and support that to the IT services that are provided. And maybe in the middle, between business services and IT services, you connect the business outcomes logic. I mean, there's a business outcome that you're expecting, which will then support the business service that you're providing to the customer or to, to your end user. And finally, the top of this pyramid is if you're trying to support the goal of the business itself. And that part is actually a completely different discussion about managing your business using principles of ITSM, which is my, my presentation at 6 p.m. tomorrow, Eastern time. Right. So kind of lines up perfectly, but mm -hmm. if you're talking about supporting the goal of the business itself, so managing, uh, managing your business using ITSM, that's what that discussion is about. Right. Finally, the top three takeaways from this discussion. One, everyone provides a service. Whether you like to call it a service or not, doesn't matter. Two, an effective CMDB is not one that holds all possible CIs in it but the one that supports easy delivery of service. And I tend to stress most on this point because we need to make sure that when we're talking about a CMDB, the true difference of CI and service asset shows up in your CMDB. If you do not care to manage it, then you should not think of it as a CI. And therefore the last takeaway, the best way to identify whether or not you need to manage a CI is to ask yourself, do I care? Yes. Think with that, um, the end of this presentation. That's, that's and Chrissy, really it's back over to you. That that was that was great. I mean, I I really like that uh, that pyramid approach. It was, uh, that was actually quite enlightening. To you know, work out what what the actual um, reason for creating your CMDB is to before you decide how you're going to how you're going to do things. That was. Very, very good, and thank you very much for uh, stepping into the breach. And, no, uh, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. It, it's uh, Like I said, it's kind of um, pretty much shameless self-running, but it does line me up for my presentation. <laughs> it does, perfectly. And I, I, I will look forward to your, to your presentation later on into UFT13. I will make sure I uh, am uh, listening to that when it comes on air. It was uh, very good, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Okay. It was a pleasure. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Introducing MyIT from BMC Software. One quick download, and the way your users think about IT changes forever. Let's say they need a networked printer, or a Wi-Fi connection, or even a map of an office they're visiting. MyIT already knows where they are, and shows them a list of available resources and services pre-configured for their devices. Or maybe your user needs help with something more complex. With MyIT, they can do most things themselves. But if they can't, they can simply schedule an appointment with a technician who can. In short, MyIT is built to make your IT organization more modern and your users infinitely happier, dramatically changing the perception of your services 